Hey, I just wanted to quickly plug that if you guys want any tutoring, some new slots have opened. If you look in the description, there's a link to my physics and maths tutor profile in which I do tutoring on there. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of the A-Level Cookbook. Today we're going to be doing the AQA and A-Level Chemistry paper from um, June 2020. This question is about emissions of oxides of nitrogen from petrol and diesel engines. Explain how oxides of nitrogen are formed in engines. So here you have oxygen in the air, you have nitrogen in the air, and in engines you have high temperatures. That's exactly why they form. So it's a reaction of N2 and O2 in the air due to high temperatures. Now to state why it's desirable to decrease emissions of oxides of nitrogen from vehicles, it's because you need to say something that's like, you know, not just vague, like harmful to the environment or it's a pollutant or something like that. You need to say like a specific consequence. So for example, it can cause formation of acid rain. Modern diesel engines use a ex diesel exhaust fluid such as AdBlue to decrease the emissions of oxides of nitrogen. AdBlue reacts with water in the hot exhaust gases to form ammonia. In the presence of a catalyst, the ammonia reacts with oxygen, oxides of nitrogen to form nitrogen and water. Give the oxidation state of nitrogen in each of the NO2, NH3, and N2 and complete the equation for the reaction between NO2 and NH3. So here, these are going to be minus 2 each. So it's going to be minus 4. So it's going to be a plus 4. So there you go. That's that oxidation state. Here, these are going to be plus 3 because it's plus one for each of these, so it's got to be minus three. And this is elemental, so it's got to be zero. To balance these out, you should probably use the electrons and the oxidation states to figure out what's going on. So if I have NO2, which is plus four, and then I've got NH3, which is going to be minus three for the Ns, and you can see it becomes zero, what's happened is the N has simultaneously been reduced from plus four to zero and gained four electrons, whereas the N here in the NH3 has gone from minus three to zero, so it's lost three electrons. In order to balance those out, I need to balance the number of electrons of either, either of these, right? So I'm going to times that by 3, and then I'm going to times U by 4. So what we end up with is we have 3NO2, 4NH3, right? And then that's going to make however many of these that add up to make these many N2s. So there's going to be 7 Ns on this side, so there's going to be 7 over 2 N2s here. And the amount of waters is how many oxygens we have, right? So we've got 3 times O2, so it's going to be 6 O2s. So it's going to be 6 h 2 there. Sorry, 6 O's, not 6 O2s. And that's how you do it. You should always try and balance equations based on the oxidation, so electrons gained and lost first, then every element that isn't hydrogen or oxygen, unless the hydrogen and oxygen are being oxidized or reduced. Then you balance the oxygen by adding waters, and then you finally add the protons in. Everyone likes to kind of just jump to doing the electrons at the very last stage. I don't think that's wise because you might have screwed something up, and also it's about the oxidation and reduction that determines the number of electrons, not the waters. So now it says state the meaning of the term heterogeneous catalyst, right? So we need to talk about both words here. So heterogeneous means it's a different state to reactants. Like, for example, if you have solid platinum and gaseous stuff. And the catalyst part is that it increases the rate of reaction without being used up. Some carbon particulates are also formed in diesel and petrol engines. Explain why. So carbon particulates is like soot and stuff like that, right? So the only reason for that to be forming rather than just CO2 is because you have incomplete combustion. There you go. So sodium oxide forms a solution with a higher pH than magnesium oxide when equal amounts of moles of each oxide are added separately to equal volumes of water. State why both oxides form alkaline solutions, and then suggest why sodium oxide forms one with a higher pH. So there's two tasks. Number one, why are they making the alkaline solutions, right? So we've got sodium oxide, Na2O, right? Oops, 2O. And we're adding it to water. The thing that you're going to be making is you're going to be making hydroxide ions. So the alkaline solutions is because... OH minus ions are produced. That's what gives, you know, alkalinity to a solution. So are produced. And then it says, suggest why sodium oxide forms a solution with a higher pH than that magnesium oxide. So remember that what we're really comparing is NaOH versus MgOH2. Now in group two, the hydroxides get more soluble as you go down the group, whereas the sulfates get less soluble. This is at the top of the, near the top of the group. So this is not going to be soluble, this OH. So as a result, this is more alkaline because it just dissociates more, it dissolves more, right? Which means you're going to get more OH minus ions. Because remember that when you dissolve NaOH, you're actually making it become Na plus aqueous and OH minus aqueous. More of these means more alkaline. So you would say that NaOH is more soluble than MgOH2. There you go. Give an equation for the reaction between phosphorus 5 oxide and water. So the formula of that is P4O10. That's something you just have to memorize. We're adding water, H2O. We're going to make uh, phosphoric acid. So we always write down what you know first immediately, and then you can balance everything out, right? So we know we're going to make H3PO4. So if we have four of these P's here, we're going to have to have four here. So that's going to be four of that, right? And then if we have four times three, that's 12 H's and um, 16 O's. If I put a six here, that's 12 H's, that's six O's. And we've got 10 O's there, so it balances out. There you go. 
So in the contact process, sulfur 4 oxide is converted into sulfur 6 oxide using vanadium 5 oxide as a catalyst. You have two equations to show how this vanadium 5 oxide acts as a catalyst. So what we do is we write down what you know first, right? So we know that this is going to be sulfur 4 oxide. So we know that it's going to be, well, the vanadium 5 is going to be V2O5 because that's going to be minus 10, right? And if there's going to be 5, the oxidation state of vanadium is plus 5. It's going to be 2 lots of plus 5. All right, so we know it's that. And we know it's going to be sulfur 4 oxide. So it's SO, and these are each minus 2. So if we're going to make it plus 4 here, it's going to be SO2. So then it's going to be that V2O5 plus SO2 makes... Well, sulfur 6 oxide is going to be SO. Each one of these is minus 2, right? If it's plus 6, we're going to need 3 of those. So SO3, right? So then whatever's left over is probably going to be this losing an oxygen. So it's going to be V2O4. And that adds up because can you see how that's minus 10? That's plus 5. Now this has become minus 8, right? So that's going to be plus 4. So this has been reduced. That's been oxidized. Fine. But remember, it says explain how it shows. It show, it's a give two equations to show that this acts as a catalyst. So what happens is this V2O4 reacts with something to eventually become, again, V2O5. All you're doing is you're upping the oxygen by one, so you could just add a half O2. There you go. Explain why complexes formed from transition metal ions are colored. So transition metal ions, right? What happens is you've got your d orbitals chilling here, right? So one, two, three, four, five. What happens is the moment a ligand binds to that transition metal, it splits into these like that, where one of them is at a higher energy. So between these two, there's an energy gap, right? Now, electrons can only move up and down the energy gap, as in become excited or not excited, if they get the right amount of energy, which is provided to it by light. If the right wavelength of light is absorbed, the electrons get gassed, and they're like, woohoo, and they move up, right? Now, what that means is that forms the color. The reason being is because, for example, if you look at a green object, right, there's your eyes. The light that's coming back to your eye is green, so it's been reflected. Whereas if we shine white light on it, white light is all light, right? As in white light is all the colors mixed together and black light is none. So if we're shining white light on this and reflecting green, it means it's absorbing all of the spectrum except green, right? And if I have a black object, it's absorbing the entirety of the light and there's no light being reflected. So the reason we see colored ions is because those electrons are absorbing specific wavelengths of light. So then everything that isn't absorbed is what's being reflected back at us. So it's not that the electrons are emitting them or anything like that, it's that they're just not absorbing certain ones, and that's why we see that, because of this split. If they don't have that split, then it means they can't absorb those wavelengths of light and move up and down. So then that's what the answer is here. So d orbital electrons absorb specific wavelengths of light, or you could say frequencies, and the remaining wavelengths, so obviously you'd write the whole thing, I'm just being lazy, are reflected when the electrons absorb the light, they're excited to a higher energy level. There you go. So the iron content of iron tablets can be determined by colorimetry. So dissolve a tablet in sulfuric acid, oxidize all of them to Fe3+, convert the Fe3+, into, an aqueous, into a complex that absorbs light to this wavelength, make the solution up to 250 centimeters cubed, measure the absorbance of light at 490 nanometers with the colorimeter, and then use a calibration graph to find the concentration of the iron-3 complex. So now it says calculate the energy in joules gained by each excited electron in the absorption at that wavelength. The speed of light is here, and then they've given you the Planck constant. So E equals HF, which is equal to HC over lambda, right? So that's going to equal 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 times 3 times 10 to the 8 all over lambda, but it has to be in meters, and that's in nanometers. It's going to be 490 times 10 to the minus 9. If we do that, we end up getting 4.06 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. There you go. Now it says, describe how a calibration graph is used, produced and used to find the concentration in the ion-3 complex. So whenever you make a calibration curve, what you're doing is you're using, you're putting concentration here, and you're putting like absorbance or whatever here, right? What you do is you record known concentrations, so I don't know, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and then you make a curve, whatever it may look like, and then you can read off of that to find out what mysterious one is. So it's literally just writing that into words. So if we do that, we end up saying, measure absorbances of known concentrations and what you do is you plot a graph of absorbance against concentration. And then what you do is to, again, find the concentration of this mysterious thing, you would just read off the graph to get the concentration of the unknown, you know, the test substance or the test complex. There you go. So the concentration of iron in this solution is that. Calculate the mass in milligrams of the iron in the tablet used to make 250 centimeters cubed of solution. So here... They've told you the concentration is that, so we can work out the moles of this Fe3 plus by doing concentration times volume. So 4.66 times 10 to the minus 3 times 250 over 1,000. If we do that, we end up getting 
0.001165 moles, right? Now that's all come from the tablet at the start. Dissolve a tablet in this acid, blah, 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 and eventually it gets into this 250 centimeter cube. So that means all of this is the moles of iron. So then what you could do is you could just work out the mass of the Fe3 plus by doing this answer 0.001165 times the MR of iron, which is 55.8. If you do that, you get 0 0.0650 grams. But the question wants in milligrams, so all you do is you times it by 1,000, which is 65 milligrams. There you go. Cisplatin is used as an anti-cancer drug. It works by causing the death of rapidly dividing cells. Name the process that is prevented by, do, uh, by cisplatin. So it's DNA replication that it mugs about with. After cisplatin enters the cell, one of the chloride ligands is replaced by a water molecule to form complex B, given equation for this reaction. So the formula of cisplatin is PT-NH3Cl2, right? And um, that's a square brackets. It's told you in the question that one of these has been replaced by water, so it's going to be just this. But instead, instead of NH3 to, sorry, whoops, it's going to be ClH2O plus, plus a Cl minus, because that's the charged Cl ligand. The Cl ligand has to be Cl minus to have that lone pair. So that's that. There you go. So when the complex iron B reacts with DNA, the water molecule is replaced as a bond forms between platinum and nitrogen atoms in a guanine nucleotide. The remaining chloride ligand is also replaced as a bond forms between platinum and a nitrogen atom in another guanine nucleotide. Figure 1 represents two adjacent guanine nucleotides in DNA. Complete figure 1 to show how the platinum complex forms a cross-link between the guanine nucleotides. So remember that in the previous question, it was complex B, right, which was um, cisplatin, but it had the waters replaced. CLs have been replaced by waters, right? Now, here, they've told you in the question, where, where has it gone? A water molecule is replaced as a bond forms between the platinum and a nitrogen atom in a guanine molecule, right? What's happened is that this whole thing and this whole thing is replaced, and we've got a bond on some nitrogen somewhere. So what we need to do is we need to pick out nitrogens that are able to do that and free to do so, and these ones here are nicely positioned. So what happens is you would draw your lone pair here and here. You'd write an arrow towards the platinum, an arrow towards the platinum, and then also you'd have your NH3s as well, like this. And then like that. You need to show the lone pairs on the nitrogen as well, otherwise you won't get the marks, because you have to show that this is forming a dative covalent bond with the platinum in the middle. So an experiment is done to investigate the rate of reaction in the question 4 part 2. And during this experiment, the concentration of cisplatin is measured at 1 minute intervals. Explain how graphical methods can be used to process the measured results to confirm that this reaction is first order. So it's telling you, you need to make a graph, what are you going to do with it? So immediately, one thing is we're measuring the concentration of cisplatin at every minute. So what you do is you would plot concentration on your y-axis and time on the x-axis, right? If you do that, we've got concentration and time. We have a line here, right? Whatever that may look like. Um, the gradient of a graph is always the change in y and the change in x, which is also the steepness. And here you can see that's the change in concentration over the change in time. So the gradient of the graph will tell you the rates, right? So in order to show that this is first order, what we can do is we'll probably get a curve. And what we can do is we work out the gradient at different points, right? And then what we can do is we then plot the gradients against the concentration, if that makes sense. The reason being is because then we'll be able to see very obviously that this is a first order or a second order reaction. Because if you have a reaction where you've got concentration against time, It'll be a curve that goes down like this, right? The problem with using that is that it's hard to tell whether it's first, second, or third order based on that. But if we take the gradients of this and then, blend, then plot the rates as in each gradient against time, right? Then what you'll see is you'll see a straight line through the origin like that. And that means it's because it's a straight line through the origin, it would be first order. Alternatively, what you could do is you could work out the, grade, the rate here, then see, you know, like where the concentration halves, for example, and then take another one, and then when it's halved again, and then take another one, and see if it halves each time as well. That's another route you can take on this, because if it halves each time it halves, then you know it's going to be first order, because the effect is the same for both. So either's fine. So plot concentration on y-axis and time on the x-axis, work out gradients of tangents each minute for rate, then you would plot rate on y-axis, a separate graph, and time on the x. And if this is a straight line through the origin, that's first order. There you go. So in another experiment, the effect of temperature on the rate of reaction in this question is investigated. Table 1 shows the results. So OK, here we go. Temperature 1 over t. We've got the rate constant and lnk. So here it wants us to fill this table out. So you would just do 1 over 318. And if you do that, you end up getting, if we're trying to keep it as 0, 0.00. So you don't really want to put it in standard form. So it's going to be 0 0.00314. Fine. Then we work out LNK. All you do is you put that into the LN button in the calculator. So 6 LN 6.63 times 10 to the minus 7 gives you minus 14.2. There we go. 
Now it says plot a graph of ln k against 1 over t and then calculate the activation energy. So I'm going to just put this here just because I can't draw this in my tablet because it will make me die and everything. So that's what it should end up looking like. Cool. Right? Now, every single straight line graph in the world will follow y equals mx plus c, where y is the y-axis, x is the x-axis, n is the gradient, and c is the y-intercept. Well, look at what you've done here then and compare. So that's our y-axis, that's our x. Rewrite this in the new form that we've just changed it to. So ln k is our y now. That still equals m times x, which is 1 over t, plus c. Compare it now to what you have, right? ln k and ln k are the same. This 1 over t has an m times done to it. This 1 over t here has minus ea over r times done to it. So that means the gradient equals minus ea over r, and then the plus ln a plus c, right? They want you to find the activation energy, so we now know the gradient of this thing is minus ea over r. So minus ea over r would equal your gradient, which is second point minus the first one over second point minus the first one, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Now a lot of people lose their minds over when I say this. For those that do maths, I get it, I know, don't worry. What I'm trying to, when I say this, it's because a lot of people who do chemistry do not do maths on biology as well. So rather than confusing them, it's easier to just stick to one method for gradients. I don't like routines normally, but this is one scenario where it does work and it's fine to do. So what I suggest to avoid confusion and mixing things up is assign a point that's y2 and then one that's like y1, right? And then you would work out the gradient y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And I find that people mix up the two. So they'll mix up some numbers from here and here and end up getting a positive or a negative result. So to keep it consistent, I always tell people, this is your y2, that's your y1. The more you go to the right, the more y2e, y3, y4, and so forth it is, not the other way around. Reason being is because people mix the numbers up and get thrown off and there's a minus minus. I've said it in previous videos and people are like, what kind of misinformation are you spreading here? Oh, it's like, I, I know, don't worry, I know. Please use a bit of common sense, it doesn't hurt. Anyways. So we're going to look at our y2 here, which is minus 16, and then our y1, remember it's minus, and our minus y1, which is going to be what? So that's um, minus 13.6, um, right? If you, if you just stick to following that routinely, you won't screw up this bit with the minus minus bit here. Then you'll do your x2 minus your x1, so your second x minus your first x, which is going to be minus 0.00328 minus 0.00310. If we do that, we get minus 13333, right? So we come back down here, we now know our gradient minus ea over r equals minus 1, 3, 3, 3, 3. So then if we times that by the uh, minus 8.31, we'll get the activation energy and it's positive as well. So if I do that, we get 110800, zero, 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 but that's in joules per mole. If you ever have r in your equation, because its units include joules, not kilojoules, this will be in joules. So in order to make it kilojoules, you have to divide it by a thousand. So if you do that, you end up getting... 110.8. But we should stick to the same number so nobody can figure they give us the question, which is 3, so we're going to do 111. There you go. So, a bomb calorimeter can be used as an accurate determination of the heat change during the combustion of a fuel. It's a container of a fixed volume that withstands the change in temperature during a reaction. The fuel is mixed with pure oxygen and the calorimeter ignited and the temperature change is recorded. The total heat capacity of the calorimeter is measured using a fuel for which the heat change is known. In an experiment to calculate C-Cal, 2 grams of hexane is ignited. A temperature change of this is recorded. Under the conditions experiment, 1 mole of hexane releases 4154 kilojoules of energy when combusted. The heat energy released is Q equals C-Cat delta T. Calculate the heat capacity in kilojoules per Kelvin. So this is a multi-step question of appreciating what these units and bits and bobs actually mean, right? Whenever we're saying kilojoules per mole with units, right? What we're saying is if we have one mole of the thing doing the enthalpy change, this is how many you know joules is either taken in or absorbed. Here, the question's told you, if we do this experiment on one mole of hexane, we get that. So the, the, the enthalpy change for this reaction for the hexane is actually 4154 kilojoules per mole, every one mole of hexane. However, they didn't use one mole of hexane here. What they've used is two grams of it. We don't know how many moles that is without actually going on and calculating it. Right, so then the moles of hexane would equal 2 divided by its MR, 2 grams of 86, which is going to be 0 0.0233 moles. So if one mole causes this much to be released, two moles would be two times this, right? Four moles would be two, four times this. So 0 0.0233 moles of it would be 0 0.0233 moles of that, like times that. So that's the heat energy that would have been released. So Q in this example would be 4154 times the number of moles we just worked out, 0 0.0233. If you do that, you end up getting 96.8, right? But that's in kilojoules. Now they want to work out the heat capacity in kilojoules per Kelvin. They've told you that Q equals C cat delta T. 
So let's rearrange this first before we put the numbers in, because then at least we know, you know, we know what we don't and what we do have and what we need. So C cat would equal Q over delta T. We just worked out Q and we need to work out delta T and they've actually just told you as well. So then in that case, it would be what we just worked out, the 96.8 divided by delta T, which was 12.4. Um, and you end up getting 7.81 there. Now it says when the experiment is repeated with two grams of octane, the temperature change recording is this. It calculate the heat change in kilojoules for mole for octane in this combustion reaction. If you are unable to get a value of CCAT, then use this here. So if we use the formula for the CCAT thing again, it was Q equals CCAT delta T. So Q equals, so Q equals CCAT delta T, right? And we just got our CCAT from before, which is 7.81 times delta T, which in this case they've told you is 12.2. If we do that, we get 95.282 kilojoules, right? It's in kilojoules per Kelvin, but we just times it by a ch ch temperature change which is in Kelvin. So that's kilojoules done, right? But we're not finished because we don't know how many moles actually led to this. This one, this answer wants it in kilojoules for every one mole of this thing. One mole causes this energy change or heat change. We don't know how many moles of octane we used as of now, but we can figure out by just working it out by doing moles of this octane equals its mass two over its MR114, which tells us that the moles of this is 0 0.0175 moles. So then this many moles led to this heat change. If we want to know how many one mole did, we're gonna divide this by this. If we do that, we get, Five, four, four, five, right? Five, four, four, five. Uh, the reason the number differs from what the mark scheme would say is because we'd done it with the previous answers question, which I got 7.81 with. We have a look from before, that's why. Because if I'd use the mark scheme one of 7.79, for example, then it would be five, four, three, zero. And then if I use this exact number as a fraction, you would end up getting five, four, one, seven. So it's just because I've rounded it, it's gone up and also combined with the previous bit here. When you're doing your working out, it's always good to try and keep as many decimal places as possible. I'm just being lazy, I'm gonna be completely honest. But you know, if we keep it exact, then you'll get like the more exact answer. So now it says state why the heat change calculated from this bomb calorimeter experiment is not an enthalpy change. So if we have a look, is there anything that gives it away what might be going on? So it's a calorimeter, it's a contained fixed volume that withstands its change in pressure in the, during the reaction. So an enthalpy change is the amount of heat energy that's been either emitted or absorbed or something like put out or taken in, right? At a constant pressure. So we're able to figure out whether the heat energy has been put out or taken in, that's fine. But what about the pressure bit? So if you have a look back at the text, let's see if there's anything that gives away what, the, you know, any problems with pressure. So it can work out the accurate determination of heat change. So that gives us part of that enthalpy definition. Right? But a bottom calorimeter is a container of fixed volume that withstands a change in pressure. So it's told you that there's a change in pressure. So by default, it cannot measure an enthalpy change because the pressure is not constant. Pre enthalpy changes can only work if you have a consistent and constant pressure, and that's it. So there you go. So pressure is not constant. There you go. So the thermometer used to measure this temperature change has an uncertainty of 0 0.1 in each reading. Calculate the percentage uncertainty in this use of the thermometer and then suggest one change to this experiment that would decrease it using the same one. So the percentage change, so the percentage uncertainty, sorry, is equal to your uncertainty over the value that you got, right? So we did a temperature change, which means we will have measured a start and a end temperature. Oh, sorry, times 100, whoops, right? So if there's 0 0.1 in each reading, because they will have read it twice to, you know, get the start temperature in the end, there's double the uncertainty over their value, 12.2 times 100. If you do that, you end up getting 1.64%, right? Here, it says, what change could you make? If you look at this, it could, you can see mathematically what it is. The uncertainty if you use the same equipment is going to be the same, right? So it's told you in the question that you're using the same thermometer, so it's still gonna be that plus or minus 0 0.1 or 0 0.2. So we wanna make the percentage uncertainty lower so it has a less big impact on our equipment. What we could just do is make the value that we measure bigger. So we wanna get a bigger temperature change. We're gonna need some way of doing that. The only way to do that here would be using more, you know, use a higher mass of fuel. So delta T is bigger, right? Because if I measure, measure your height, for example, with a ruler, and it's like, I don't know, you're 170 centimeters, but for some reason I have some really rubbish ruler that's plus or minus five centimeters, then the range of values that your height takes is 165 to 175. That's pretty not good. Whereas for some reason, if you were a giant and you actually were this tall, whoops, plus or minus five, then the height, you, the range of heights you could take is 169999995, all the way to 170000005, which can you see that the impact of that is teeny compared to here. There you go. Standard electrode potentials are measured by comparison with the standard hydrogen electrode. State the substances and conditions that are needed for a standard hydrogen electrode. So what we need is we need, first of all, we need some form of hydrogen that can exchange with itself 
you know, through oxidation and reduction, right? So in the same way, for example, you'd be switching from Cu solid to and from Cu2+, plus, right, aqueous, we need to do that with hydrogen. So what we're going to be using is hydrogen gas, because that's the only form that we can swap it around with, right? And we're going to have to have a solution that has this when it's either oxidized or reduced. Now we can oxidize it and we'll get H pluses. So we'll need H plus aqueous, like an acid of some sort, e.g. like HCl, right? Now, because we're switching from two um, oxidation states, right? But one, they're both of the same thing and they're not in like a solid and like an aqueous phase as in there's no electrode you can make physically of this. You'll also need a platinum electrode as well, right? Because for example, with a Cu solid, a Cu solid that can act as the electrode. And then obviously when it becomes Cu2 plus aqueous, it would just, you know, swap back and forth. Whereas here, you can't have a gas, you know, like electrode and you can't have an aqueous electrode either. Now, those are the substances we need. And let's talk about the conditions. So this is a gas. This is where you've got to keep the, when you have gases involved, you have to keep the pressure constant. So you need to make sure that that's 100 kilopascals. This is a solution that's providing these H plus ions. We need to make sure that that is one mole per decimeter cubed because we want to make sure there's one mole of H pluses and then this, this many H2s. And then in the platinum electrode, we also need to make sure that our temperature is constant at 298 Kelvin. There you go. Alternatively, to provide one moles of H+, plus, you could also use 0.5 mole per decimeter cubed of H2SO4, so long as the end concentration of H+, plus is one mole per decimeter cubed. So it's difficult to ensure consistency with the setup of a standard hydrogen electrode. A Cu2 plus aqueous Cu a solid electrode with this E cell value can be used as a secondary standard. A student does an experiment to measure the standard electrode potential for the TiO2 plus, 2 plus aqueous Ti solid electrode using the Cu2 plus aqueous Cu solid electrode as a secondary standard. A, st a suitable solution containing acidified TiO2 plus aqueous is formed when oxy titanium oxysulfate is dissolved in 0.5 mol per decimeter cubed sulfuric acid to make 50 centimeters cubed of solution. Describe an experiment the student does to show that the standard electrode potential for TiO2 plus aqueous Ti solid is this. A student is provided with the Cu2 plus aqueous Cu solid electrode ready to use, a solid titanium, you know, oxysulfate, 0.5 mole per decimeter cube sulfuric acid, a strip of titanium, laboratory apparatus and chemicals. So your answer should include details on how to prepare this solution, how to connect the electrodes, measurements taken, how the measurements should be used to calculate the standard electrode potential for the TiO2 plus and Ti solid um, electrode. So there's multiple steps here to do with this, but it's okay because if we just follow it bit by bit, we'll be okay. Okay, so we need to work through this step by step. So if we do the first bit, preparing, so I'm going to number these, one, two, three, four. So if we talk about part one, it says to prepare the solution of acidified TiO2 plus. Now, if we're making half cells of this, we need to make sure that this concentration of whatever it ends up being is one mole per decimeter cubed of the ion, right? So we need to make sure that if there's going to be one mole of this per decimeter cubed, there's also going to be one mole of this per decimeter cubed. We need to figure out what the volume of this has to be in this scenario, or at least the moles, and we can try and figure out the volume. The question's told you that a suitable solution containing this ion is formed when this is reacted with this to make 50 centimeters cubed a solution. So we now know that our volume is going to be 50 centimeters cubed, right? So then if you know that n equals CV, we can work out the, the moles of the TiOSO4 we need to make sure that we get 50 centimeters cubed of a one mole dm cubed solution. So what you'll do is you will just do uh, one times 50 over a thousand, and you should get 0 0.05 moles needed of the TiOSO4, right? Now we need to figure out its mass. So it's just gonna be mole times the MR, which is going to be 0 0.05 times its MR, which is 159.9 that they told you in the question. If we do that, we get, 7.995 grams. So now we need to talk about the actual prepping part of this. So what we need to do is we need to dissolve it in the minimum amount of solvent needed and then make it up to 50 because that's the standard solution that they want. So what we do is we'll place weighing bottle on a balance, add, you know, it's a weigh really, 7.995 grams of TiOSO4, right? And then dissolve in minimum amount of acid because that's what we need to use here, amount of acid, and then, you know, uh, what's the word? Put this in to a volumetric flask and wash and transfer the washings as well. So it's, you're gonna wash with the acid as well. So nothing's left behind. And transfer washings, fill to, because we want a 50 centimeter cubed sample, we're gonna fill to the 50 centimeter cubed mark and invert. Now we have our standard solution, that bit's done step one, right? 
cool. We don't need to do the sort of weighing the bottle before and after thing in this circumstance because you can just, you're, you're not losing anything behind. You're actually taking it all out if you wash it and put it in there like that. Cool. Now it says how to connect the electrodes. So what we now need to do is we need to set up what we got going on here. So you can just draw this diagrammatically and explain it. So here's one electrode. Here's your other one chilling. Well, one half cell, sorry, and the other one is the solution. Here's an electrode as a circuit. We're going to have a voltmeter here and then we're going to have another electrode here. Cool. What we need to do is we need to show that we're, you know, how we're doing this. So because we're going between titanium solid to titanium, you know, TiO2 plus, you can have a titanium solid here. You can have TiO2 plus aqueous. And remember that's one mole dm minus three. And then the other one that we're going to be using is uh, Cu solid and then Cu2 plus aqueous, which is again, one mole dm minus three. Remember that we've got our voltmeter here. And then we also need to make sure we have a salt bridge connected to them as well. So a salt bridge. So we've got our salt bridge connected and all of that kind of stuff going on. Now what we need to do is we need to talk about the measurements we would take. So for part three, if I just write it here instead. So for part three, what you would do is you would record the voltage of the cell, because that will tell you the potential difference of this whole unit here. In the question, they've told you what? They've told you that this electrode has this, right? Now here, it's trying to say, describe how you could do this to show that this is this, right? So we need to work out what this cell should really show if that makes sense. So what we need to do is we know that E cell equals E reduced minus E oxidized, right? Now here, it's told you to show that this electrode would be this, which can you see is uh, that's going to be reduced because that's more positive and the other one's more negative. So in, the th in theory, that would be reduced to 0 0.34 minus minus what's being oxidized, which is 0 0.88, right? Which should give you plus 1.22 volts. So you're explaining how if you got this, you would then go backwards if that makes sense. So then you would say the voltage me the reading should be plus 1.22 volts. Therefore, since E cell equals E reduced minus E oxidized, right? You can rearrange this to get E oxidized equals E cell, oh sorry, E oxidized would equal E reduced minus E cell, which would be E oxidized equals and then E reduced with the copper, so 0 0.34 minus 1.22, which should give you minus 0 0.88. I know that seems a bit odd that you're working it out beforehand and then saying, oh, this is what it should be, but I calculated it before. That's what they're trying to get you to show. So in summary, what you've got to do to do this solution, this uh, question, sorry, is you've got to make a solution that ends up being one mole per decimeter cubed. They've told you what volume you need to use here, right? That's not got anything to do with the other bit. The reason it's 0 0.5 mole per meter cubed sulfuric acid is because that's H2SO4 and that's to make sure the H plus is just one mole, right? The key thing here is that you're trying to um, make a one mole per meter cubed solution of this eventually. So that's going to be a concentration. This is going to be a volume because they've told you it has to be 50. Then you've got to set up the actual electrodes like, you know, there. And then you need to show what, like, obviously we don't have the actual answer. That's why we had to go and kind of awkwardly work it out and then go backwards. But you would say, here's what I measure. Here's what it should show. Then I can rearrange this to find out what the, the um, TiO2 plus titanium electrode essentially is. That's kind of how you have to go about doing this. It's a really awkward question. I do appreciate that. But if you just follow those steps bit by bit, you could at least secure the bag and most of it like that. Now it says, give the half equation for this electrode reaction in this electrode in acidic conditions. So here they've told you in the question that we're starting with TiO2 plus aqueous, and we are becoming Ti solid, right? Now, a lot of people love to just go and say, okay, I'm going to do everything else but the electrons. I'm going to leave those to the end. I don't think that's the wisest idea because you screw things up. I'd say do the electrons first, then balance everything else that isn't hydrogen and oxygen, unless they're also in the oxidizing and reducing parts, right? And then balance the oxygens with water, and then finally add your H pluses. So here, this is two plus overall. We've got TiO, right? So that's going to be minus two. So this oxidation state of titanium has to be plus four. Now, if you look here, plus four to zero. So it's been reduced. That means it must have gained electrons. Reduction is gaining. So immediately we can tell that that means we have four electrons on this side. Now we need to balance the rest out. So titanium is balanced, titanium is balanced. O is not balanced. So to fix that, we add an H2O here, right? But now we have more H's on this side than we do here. So what we need to do is we need to add two H pluses here like that. There we go. And then if you check the charges, two plus two makes four, minus four is nothing, and then here is nothing. So that's why you should really do it like that rather than just going and trying everything else before the electrons. 
a lot of people struggle with actually balancing that equation. It's I think it's, to be honest, from what I've seen from what I'm teaching is people dive to doing everything else but the electrons last. The electrons will tell you how much of each, you know, thing, reducing or oxidizing thing you need. Before you figure that part out, you really can't do anything else, to be honest. So table two shows some electrode potential data. Use the table two to explain why copper does not react with most acids, but does with nitric acid and give an equation. So it says give an equation for the reaction between copper and nitric acid. So that doesn't mean it's going to be Cu2 plus like off the bat. You need to go and look at specifically what it says. If it's copper, then it's Cu solid. It wouldn't say, it would say Cu2 plus or copper two ions. This is copper. So we need to think about why this would not react with most acids, but will with nitric acids. If I just clean out this mess here that we've made. If it's going to react with an acid, it is going to act as a base, which means this is going to act when it's going to have an H plus, H plus, right? Now, electrode reactions, when they are reacting, they have to be either feasible or not feasible, right? So if we show that we have Cu solid and NO3 minus, and technically H plus as well, but the NO3 minus, right? Your E cell would equal the reduced E reduced minus E ox, which would be the reduced, which is going to be 0 0.96 minus 0 0.34. If you do that, you end up getting 0 0.62 volts. That's positive, therefore feasible. So then if we look at copper reacting with another one, again, we have to start with Cu solid, and it's reacting with an acid. So if it's going this way, the other one's got to be going that way anyway. And also, if you, if you combine the equations, you're showing Cu plus is acting with, sorry, Cu solid is acting with that too, reacting with that. So that fits the bill. For the Cu solid and 2H plus, the E cell would equal... So what's getting reduced and oxidized? So it's going to be, that's got to be oxidized here, and that one's going to be reduced. So if we do that, it's going to be 0 minus the oxidized, minus 3, 0 0.34, which is minus 0 0.34. And that's negative, therefore it's not feasible. That's what they're getting at here. So when you're talking about reactions happening and not happening with electrode potentials and stuff like that, it's to do with feasibility, really. You can use that as an explanation here. Or alternatively, you could go ahead and say things like, um, you know, one's more more of a power reducing agent, one's less powerful of a reducing agent as well. So when heated, a sample of potassium chloride produces this much oxygen heated at 298 kelvins and 110 kilopascals. What is the amount of moles of potassium chloride that has decomposed? So we need to do this step by step. Here they've told you what R is as well, so PV equals NRT, and we're looking for the amount of moles that was decomposed, right? So N equals PV over RT. So we need to look at the information that we've been given. So we've been, we've been given the volume, we've been given the temperature, and we've been given the pressure here for what gas for the oxygen, right? So the moles would be the pressure. So it has to be in base units. You can't do 110. It has to be one. It'd be 110000 pascals PV, right? Times V, which is going to be 67.2. But we're going from centimeters cubed. It has to be in meters cubed. So it's going to be divided by a million. So times 10 to the minus 6 all divided by R, which is 8.31 times the temperature, which is 298 Kelvin. If we do that, we get 2.985 times 10 to the minus 3. But we're not done, because if we have a look, that's in a 3 to 2 ratio here. So in order to figure out how much there is of the KCLO, because that's what they want us to do, you're going to do your answer. What are you going to do? You're going to divide it by 3 times by 2. So divided by 3 times by 2, or you could do uh, times 2 thirds. If we do that, we get 1.99 times 10 to the minus 3, which is B. There you go. So next, it says, which has a bond angle of 109.5? So to me, that is tetrahedral, and that means you're going to have four bonding, zero lone pairs. That's what you go in for. So now you've got to look for anything that has that, where it's all four bonding, lone pair, zero lone pairs, and immediately diamond, because diamond is macromolecular, and there's four, four bonds around each carbon. You can quickly work out the shapes of everything else as well. So an N, H, H, it would have been, there's a lone pair there, and then an extra one there, but it's NH2 minus, there's an extra here. So can you see how you've got two bonding, two lone, so that's not that. And then over then H3 as well, for example, here, that's got one, two, three bonding, one lone. So immediately, it's just got to be A. The definition says it's where you're making one mole of a substance from its elements in their standard state. So the first thing I'm going to do is see if any of those don't fit the bill, because I know I have to make one mole. Unfortunately, annoyingly, all of those all make one mole, so I can't cancel anything out. The next thing, though, is to look at what, where, you know, the definition says from its elements in their standard states. So I know we're making it from silver, which is a solid, so I'm going to go look for where I can knock everything else out that isn't. That's gaseous silver, doesn't exist as a gas, and it doesn't exist as a gas ion either, and it doesn't exist aqueous either. So immediately, just by doing that, it's B. And iodine exists as a solid at standard states as well in standard conditions. So there you go. 
now we got some bond enthalpies and it says, what's the enthalpy change of this reaction in kilojoules per mole? So immediately, but rather than doing all this bonds made, bonds broken BS, I just look at it and think, well, here, bond enthalpy means you're breaking one mole of a specific bond into atoms. So I quickly sketch a Hess's law cycle, atoms, right? Here, the definition says it's one mole of bonds to atoms. This is going to be bonded stuff with all those moles of bonds. It's going to be broken into atoms, enthalpy into atoms. Enthal bond enthalpy into atoms and bond enthalpy into, enthalpy into atoms. So if I have CH4, I know I'm going to have four CH bonds here. So that means I'm going to have four lots of 412 here. Now, if I have O2, I've got one of those, but there's two of them, right? So it's going to be two lots of 496. And then here, CO2 is this and this. So I know there's going to be two lots of um, CO, so it's going to be 2743. And then here, H2O as well, HOH. Each one of them has two, but I've got. Um, I've got uh, two of them, so it's going to be four lots of four, six, three. The question saying the enthalpy change of this reaction, which is that enthalpy change, if you start and finish at the same point, the enthalpy change here will be the same from the other root. So then that means that delta H is just going to be four lots of four, one, two, plus two lots of four, nine, six. And because we're going against these arrows, minus two lots of um, seven, four, three, minus four lots of four, six, three. And then if you do that, you get minus 698, which is D. This is the most foolproof method of doing like any enthalpy change questions. Please do Hess's law cycles. I hate bonds made, bonds broken, and all that garbage. It just, it's so much room for error. This just is much more reliable, and it means you have to actually remember the definitions. And it means you also have to know how to use a cycle. It's just a win-win across the board. So in which conversion is the metal reduced? So again, reduced means you're gaining electrons. We just need to see where the oxidation state changes and goes lower. What I would do with this style of question is to basically just look at the oxidation states very quickly for each one of them. And I'd go for the easier looking ones first. Because there's a CR2 here, I'll have to do extra juggling my head to balance this and that out, right? Whereas all of the rest of these are just one metal, you know, per molecule, if that makes sense. Like there's just one V, right? Whereas here there's CR2, so I'd have to also half it and there's extra steps, right? So I'm just going to start with all the others. And then, you know, if I was assuming I've done all all those right, it should be fine. So here, O4 and minus, right? That's going to be minus 8. That's going to be plus 7 oxidation state there in order to give you a minus 1 over here. O4 minus 8, and it's going to be 2 minus overall, so it's going to be plus 6. So it's gone from plus 6 to plus 7, so you're out. Next. Here, that's minus 2 overall. Each one of them is minus 2, so it's going to be minus 6 for this. So that means the oxidation state of this has to be plus 4 so in order to give this. Whereas here, that's going to be minus 4. That's going to be plus 4. So that's actually not changed, so you're out as well. Next. VO2 plus... That's going to be minus 2, so the V has to be plus 4 to give you a 2 plus overall. And it's VO3 minus, so that's going to be minus 6. And you can see that has to be plus 5 to give you a minus 1 overall. Can you say that's plus 5 to plus 4? It's been reduced, so it is D. Done. I mean, I can go and do the chromium one as well, but I just, you know, I'm lazy. I kind of want to do the shortcut ways as much as I can. So you try and find the easiest routes and go in looking for what you want. With a lot of multiple choice questions, identify the thing that you're going to use rather than like step by step in everything. If it says it's reduced, I'm looking for whichever one the oxidation state has gone down in and I'm going to quickly test all of them. That's how you do these. So it says here, the rate expression for this reaction X and Y is this, which statement is correct? Unfortunately, there's no hack, but to just go through one by one. So it says, which statement is correct? The rate constant has these units. Fine. So I know that rate is mole dm minus three and we're going to be dividing it, and sorry, s minus one, right? So the s minus one bit's happy there. And we know we're dividing it by mole dm cubed squared and a mole dm cubed Again, so it's going to be mole dm minus 3 cubed, which actually ends up becoming mole dm minus 3 s minus 1 all over mole 3 dm uh, minus 9. Immediately, I can see that if I divide these two, I'll end up with mole minus 2. So that means immediately this one's out. So that's that one's gone. The rate of the reaction is halved if the concentration of x is halved and the concentration of y is doubled. So if they've told you that we're halving this, so it would be k times a half x squared, and then y is doubled to y. That's how I like to do it, because then you can see that that's being squared as well. So the rate ends up happening. What, what happens to the rate is it will be half squared times by 2, which is the same as saying the rate has become um, a quarter times 2. If we do that, we can see that the, end, the rate ends up still being a half, because, you know, those are the effects combined. So it's actually just b. There you go. Done. So which statement about pH is correct? The pH of a weak base is independent of the temperature. That is incorrect because KW, KC, KA, KP, all of them depend on temperature. This is all about dissociation. And remember, that's an equilibrium reaction. So immediately, temperature is the one that's screwing that up. And it says, a temperature is above 298 Kelvin. The pH of pure water is less than 7. So this may be true. We need to figure out logically the steps. Because the thing is, pH only measures H+. You can have pure waters with a pH that are less than, you know, that can be like 6, 5, 4. If you have pure water and a pH of 5, that doesn't guarantee that it is definitely acidic because all it's doing is it's measuring the pH. When you have a neutral solution, it doesn't mean the pH is 7. It means that the concentration of H plus and OH minus are equal, right? So if we have a quick think about the steps between what's happening, 
Leaving that logically, H2O will dissociate into H plus and OH minus, right? This forward reaction, because we're breaking bonds, bond breaking, most likely going to be endothermic. Exothermic is bond making, endo is bond breaking. And it says here, the temperatures are higher. So if we're increasing the temperature, this equilibrium will shift to try and decrease the temperature, which means it will move in the endothermic direction, which means it's going to move to the right-hand side, right, to absorb that heat. If it's moving to the right-hand side, the amount of H+, plus therefore, has to be going up. If the H+, plus concentration moles are going up, then the concentration would also go up as well. There's more H+, plus, which means the pH drops. That doesn't necessarily mean it's more acidic, because the OH- minus would also change in the same manner, and the H+, plus and OH- minus are equal. So therefore, it's got to be B, because pH only measures how much H+, plus you have. So 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed aqueous solution of an acid is being slowly added to a 25 centimeter cubed sample of a 0.1 per decimeter cubed aqueous solution of a base. Which acid-base pair has the highest pH of the equivalence point? So the equivalence point, when you're adding like an acid and a base, for example, together, right? You've got this vertical part here, and the equivalence point is that one middle bit in the middle, okay? So we want to make sure that it has the highest pH, which means the lowest H+. plus. Remember that H+, plus is only what pH measures. pH only measures the amount of H+, plus that you have. It doesn't tell you about whether something's, you know, acidic or basic unless you're comparing it to water. Because remember, like, if you have a neutral solution, you'll have equal amounts of H plus and OH minus. We want to pick something with the most OH minus as possible to get that higher equivalence point, which is going to be a strong base. So immediately that and that are out. Now we're stuck between a weak acid and a strong base, and a strong acid and a strong base. Now, as a general rule of thumb, if you react a strong acid and a strong base, you will get something that's quite close to a pH of 7 at room temperature as well. Whereas if we have a weak acid and a strong base, it's going to overshoot a little bit with that equivalence point being actually higher. So that's going to give you the highest pH there. There you go. In the test for a halide ion in aqueous solution, dilute nitric acid is added before the addition of silver nitrate. Why is this acid added? In your head, you should be like, oh, it's to get rid of any precipitates that could give you false positives, which immediately is this one there. It prevents the precipitation of silver compounds. It gets rid of carbonates, which can form precipitates that might mislead you into thinking, oh, wow, there's something there. Next, it says, which shows the major products form when chlorine reacts with cold dilute aqueous sodium hydroxide. So if we're doing that, we're looking at the major products, right? So chlorine and aqueous sodium hydroxide that is cold and dilute should immediately ring bells to you that this is the disproportionation reaction, which means we're going to make NaCl and NaClO. There, that's just one of the examples in here now. So now it says, which of these show the electron configuration of an atom of a transition metal? So a lot of people are like, oh, it has to have an incomplete D subshell. That might not necessarily be true. Because, for example, if you think about copper, that's 4s1, 3d10, right? And if, it's a, if you were to make Cu2+, plus, you would have 4s0, 3d9. So that doesn't always guarantee it. However, we can sort of use that here anyway. And also, you can look at your periodic table. So, I mean, if we look at 4s2, 3d0... The best and safest thing to do in these kinds of questions is to just look at the periodic table. 4s2, 3d0, right? So the idea is that's period 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, right? And these are your groups. So if it's in, it's in the S block, which is here, and it's in period 4. So that's period 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's 4s2, 3d0, that's calcium, so you're out. Next, it says 4s2, 3d8. So we're in the period 4, which is this entire column here. But this, the, remember, these are all 3Ds because they're transition metals, right? So 3D1, 2, 3, 4. Well, that would actually be 5, actually, because remember, chromium acts funny. So 5, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Well, that would be 10, remember, because that one acts funny as well. 10. So in that case, nickel was what was picked up, which means 17 has to be B. Just be careful. Although that incomplete D subshell thing would work here, sometimes it wouldn't necessarily you have to be careful because although the incomplete D subshell stuff works here, not all transition metals have an incomplete D subshell. That one doesn't because that's not copper. Copper here would have been 3D9, but it prefers to actually be 4S1 3D9, 3D10, sorry. Can you see how that's a complete D subshell? So the question may have tricked you in that sense. It has come up a couple of times in other exam board papers. So that's why I just say safe is better, so just quickly periodic table it. Which will not act as a ligand in the formation of a complex ion, so what do you have to do to be a ligand? To be a ligand, you need to donate a lone pair of electrons to form a dative covalent bond. Whatever of these cannot do that will be the ligand, and immediately that's A. It cannot. Next it says, which shows the correct oxidation state of coordination number of cobalt in CONH35ClCl2, right? So we need to break this down into chunks. If we have a look, that's Cl2, right? That's, those are chloride ions separated to this. So that's going to be minus 2, so this entire thing has to be plus 2. So if we have CO, right, and essentially the only two, the NH3s aren't charged, and the overall thing has got to be plus 2, then this Cl minus, Cl has to be 1 minus. This cobalt has to be something that's minus 1 to give you an overall charge of plus 2, which is plus 3. If that's the case, then we know immediately 
that A and B are out. You two are gone. Now we need to figure out its coordination number. The coordination number is the number of coordinate bonds it has, not the number of ligands. That's different. Because if it were to have a bidentate ligand, coordination number is still six, because there's six coordinate bonds. It just has three ligands instead. So what we're doing here is we're looking for how many dative covalent bonds it has. It has five from the NH3s and one from a Cl minus, so that means it's six, so it's D. There you go. So which statement is not correct? So CuCl42 minus is square planar. That is incorrect. It's tetrahedral. The only ones that are square planar are things like, for example, a cisplatin and transplatin. So that's out. And a CuCl4 minus is a tetrahedral thing. So immediately that one's one. But we can check the others as well. So NH4 plus is tetrahedral. Well, it has four bonding, four, four, sorry, one, two, three, and then four. You can treat that as if that's another bonding pair. So it's got four bonding pairs, zero lone pairs. So that is tetrahedral. This is octahedral. Well, it's got six coordinate bonds. Even though these are bidentate ligands, there's three of them. It's six coordinate bonds, so that is correct. And here, that's octahedral as well, because it's got six coordinate bonds, so immediately it has to be A. Which compound decolorizes acidified potassium manganate solution? Immediately, what I'm thinking in my head is that this is a transition metal. If it's going to be decolorized, it's not going to have an incomplete D subshell anymore. So the D subshell is either empty or full. Right, this may be incompletely horrendously wrong. Maybe, we'll see, right? So potassium manganate, MnO4 minus. That's minus eight, that's plus seven. So the oxidation state of this is plus seven. And if we want to decolorize it, we're going to have to make Mn solid, which is zero. All right, so we need to look at any one of these that could possibly react in this to make that happen and become that way. So if we're doing this, we're going from plus seven to zero. That means that this is being reduced. So whatever's happening that's reacting with it has to be oxidized, right? So here, that's Al3+. plus. The oxidation states that you know of are just Al3+. Al plus. It might go to Al2+, plus and some weird reaction, but it's not as clear cut to me. That's what I'm thinking. Here, that's Cu2+. Plus. Now, the only other oxidation state that you guys get taught at is, again, Cu1+, plus, and that's not a transition metal, which would be, you know, obviously not colored. But the problem is, is if that way it became 1+, plus, that's been reduced. But remember, we're looking for something that must be oxidized. Now, if you look at FeSO4, that's 2+. Plus. This, Fe2+, plus, you guys know that 2+, plus and 3+, plus exist. It could be Fe3+, plus, which means this could be oxidized, right? So that's a possible one that looks good. Here, Fe2SO4-3, that's going to be 3+, plus because there's a 2 minus and there's 3 of them. The only other oxidation state that you guys get taught is, again, 2+, plus, which would be reduced. So by, pro by that logic, it's got to be C, right? Now, if we then took it one step further and actually wrote an equation for all of that, I don't think we actually have to do that, to be honest. I think that's in itself enough, so it would be C. So it says here, which compound decolorizes acidified potassium manganate solution? So the logic that I'm using here is that if it's decolorizing, transition metals, remember, form colored complexes. So if we're going to decolorize it, whatever it is is no longer a transition metal, so it's not going to be a stable ion with an incomplete D subshell, right? So that means that this will eventually have, you know, and either empty or full D subshell in order to not have a color. So then if I think about this, manganate, that's MnO4 minus. That's minus eight plus seven. So manganate in this reaction must eventually become Mn2, you know, so it says an Mn, like the plus seven, to an Mn of an oxidation state of zero. If that's happened, that's been reduced, okay? If that's been reduced, something else must be oxidized because you can't have reduction without the other thing. You can't have like reduction without oxidation, you can't have oxidation without reduction. So using that logic, I need to think of what possibly can react with this to do that. Now if I have a look here, Al2SO43, the ions that you guys get taught is Al3+. Plus. There isn't really, if that was to be oxidized, that'd be Al4+, plus, which it doesn't really tend to do, and you guys don't, don't get taught that, so that's out. Cu, that's Cu2+, plus. if it was to be oxidized, you'd get Cu3+, plus, which again, you guys don't get taught as, and it's not a commonly occurring ion, so you're out. FeSO4, that's Fe2+, plus. if we were to oxidize that, it would become Fe3+, plus, possibly. That looks pretty feasible, because then if it needs seven electrons here, you could just dash seven of them there, so that looks pretty good. Here, that's plus three. If that's being oxidized, that would be Fe4+, plus, which you don't get, so that's again that, so it's got to be C on that premise. So now which one has Ez isomers? If you have Ez isomers, you've got a double bond here, and you've got two different things on each carbon, or four, right? So we're looking for whichever one fits the bill there. That's C2H2Br2, so c 2 h H, B, R, and B, R, that's possible. So that could, get, could be one, right? If we then swapped it for C, 2, H, 3, B, R, there's an H here, so that can't be it. And if it was C, 2, H, 4, B, R, 2, that's not an alkene anymore, so that one's out. And this one, again, is not an alkene either, so it has to be A. 
it's not nucleophilic substitution either because we treat these to have the same electronegativity between the two of them. So it's not really that carbon deficient. And again, the only way to get from an alkane bit, an alkyl bit, to a haloalkane bit is by doing free radical substitution in the things that you guys get taught. Which compound decolorizes bromine water in the absence of sunlight? So the sunlight bit is hinting at the fact that you need to use free radical substitution to get some radicals. So if we have a look here, that's got CH3, CH2, CH2Br. That's a halogenoalkane, so it won't do that. Next, this is benzene. It doesn't react freely with bromine water, so that's out. This is a cycloalkane, so it also won't do that. Whereas here, CH3, CH2, CH, CH2. Well, there's got to be a double bond there, so that has to be an alkene. CH3, CH2, CH. CH2. So that means it's got to be D. Which compound reacts to form a ketone when warmed with an acidified solution of potassium dichromate? So rather than testing every single one of them, I'm going to go in and, you know, with what I want to find, what I want to look. If we're making a ketone, you must have a secondary alcohol, right? A secondary alcohol means that you've got a carbon-carbon with an OH like this and a carbon like that and an H there. That's a secondary alcohol. So here, that's a primary alcohol because it's on the end, so that's out. This one here, if we just focus on that CH bit there, CH, OH, CH3, H3C, that's a secondary alcohol. That's looking pretty good. If you have a look here, CHO, that's an aldehyde. You should be able to recognize it just by looking at it. And then again here, that's a carboxylic acid, so it wouldn't, so it is B. Which does not contain an asymmetric carbon atom? That means chiral, because for example, if I have one, two, three, four different groups, like Br, F, and Cl, there's no symmetry around the carbon because there's no symmetrical groups. Whereas if I have like F and F, can you see those two same groups? It's symmetrical in that sense. So it just means whichever one has not got a chiral carbon. So then all we do is we look at them one by one. So this carbon has three H's on it, so that part's not chiral. This carbon's got an H and a CH3 and another CH3 on it, so that's, part, that's not chiral. This has two hydrogens on it, so that's immediately not chiral, and this one has three hydrogens. So there you go, that's the one that isn't chiral, off the bat, done. Now it says here, which one involves addition elimination? So addition means you're adding this whole chunk on, but we've got to boot something else off just to let it fit. It's not the same as substitution, because we're swapping like for like, if that makes sense. You're swapping one group for another group. Here, we're actually sticking a whole new group on, booting off something to make space for it, if that makes sense. I can see straight off the bat, these two are being added to make one thing, that's just addition, there's no eliminating happening. So immediately, we're off on that one, it's done. So if you look at this first one, we've got a halogenoalkane, we're adding KOH, we end up with an alkene, and KVR, and an H2O. So this is just elimination. We're not adding anything on, we're actually kicking stuff out. So that's immediately out. Next, we have CH3COCl, an acyl chloride, plus an alcohol, and we make an ester because it's been added on at the expense of booting off an HCl. So that immediately is one of them. Like, that's got to be it. And the mechanism by which it does that is nucleophilic addition elimination. Now, if you have a look at this last one, we've got a halogenoalkane, we're adding an AOH, and that BR has been swapped for the OH. That's not addition elimination, that's substitution, so it's got to be B. So now it says, which compound reacts with HBr to give you 2-bromo-3-methylbutane as the major product? So obviously it's an alkene that they're all reacting with. So just draw out real quick what the actual product would be. So 1, 2, 3, 4, it's 3, so it's 2-bromo, so the BR would be here, and it's 1, 2, 3-methyl, CH3. So that means this carbocation originally must have been here. The double bond must have either been here or here, right? What we do is we go through them one by one and filter through them all bit by bit. So if you have a look, that's a C double bond C and there's two CH3s on it, whatever's right. And then we've got an H and a CH3. That would not give us a secondary carbocation that would fit the bill here, so that's out. If we next have a look at B, so we've got a CH3 here, we've got a CH2 in the middle, CH2, and then a CH and double bond, and then a CH2 on that end, sorry, whoops, here. That's not branched, so that's immediately out as well. If you have a look at C then, so C is CH3, CH2, C, and then there is a CH3 on here, a double bond CH2. So although it's branched, the problem is, is it still wouldn't give us a carbocation where we want it to be, because it'd be either here or here. But we want it to be on 2-bromo-3-methyl. If it was here, that would be 1-bromo-2-methyl. So that's out. So it's got to be this last one here, D. And if you then test it, it would be that as well. So which one forms a polymer with CLO whatever, right? So the polymer types that you guys know is addition polymerization, where a double bond opens up, and condensation polymerization, where you end up either making an ester link or an amide link. So you should be able to recognize an ester link looks like this and an amide link would look like this, right? So if we're dealing with the this thing here, that is an acyl chloride, C double bond OCl. A lot of the times in the reactions you guys get taught, you get COOH and an OH, right? And they'll form that ester link. This can behave similarly to a carboxylic acid. So if, for example, if we wanted to make an ester link, you would react a carboxylic acid and an alcohol and you would get the ester link. If you wanted to make a, an amide link, 
you would get the carboxylic acid. That's where that double bond O comes from. And the other thing must have been an amine. So here, if this is behaving similarly to a carboxylic acid, it's going to either require an alcohol or an amine to do the reaction. So immediately, 29 has to be A, because you can see there's two amine groups here, so it will polymerize. If we have a look here, we've got CH3CO2O. That's an acid anhydride, which is another analog for carboxylic acids. So you can use that as well in a similar sense to carboxylic acids. That will not react with something that's also a carboxylic acid. It's almost like putting carboxylic acid and carboxylic acid together. So that's out. If you have a look then, CH3CH2CONH2. So C double bond O N H2, that is an amide. So that's not going to react because it's the thing that we end up making. NH2, CH2, CAOH. So while this has an amine on it, it's not going to make a polymer because you can only make one group come off of it. You can only make one amide link with this. Whereas here, this is a double-ended acyl chloride, so there's both of them, so you can continue making them in a long chain because this is double-ended too, so that's that. Which structure shows the switch ion of an amino acid? So every amino acid in the universe has a C, it has an R group, it has an H, a COOH, and an NH, sorry, an H2N here, right? So if it's a switch ion, this part will have accepted a proton to become a plus here, and that would have lost an H plus to become that, right? So we need to look for whichever one fits the bill with this. So one by one, we go and have a look. So we've got a CH, we've got all of that stuff, right? But that's not a switcher ion because there's that amine group has accepted a proton. That CO minus has lost its proton, but it's also got an extra amine here, which isn't part of a switcher ion. The switcher ion only hinges on these two bits. So you're at next. This has accepted the proton, that's lost it. But again, that's also lost a proton. So that's again, not a switcher ion because it only hinges on these two. So that's that. Here, this hasn't got... Well, that, that's for some reason gained an H+, plus when it hasn't, when it's this that does, so that's that. And if we look at D, that's gained a proton, that's lost a proton. This is all to do with the amino acid bit, so that's that. The switcher ion bit only hinges on the amino acid components of it. If you had excessively, you know, like acidic conditions, and that would also accept a proton here, but the key thing about the switcher ion bit is this. It's the pH that lands this part. Now it says, what is the minimum volume in centimeters cubed of 0 0.02 mole per decimeter cubed KMnO4 solution needed to oxidize this much VO2 plus? So if we're oxidizing this, the other thing is getting reduced. Now the question's given you the equation conveniently here. If we're oxidized, that's getting oxidized, so this must be doing the reducing. If we have 0 0.01 moles of this, and the question said, how much volume of this mysterious thing do we need? This will provide your MnO4 minuses. So the concentration of MnO4 minus that we have is 0 0.02 mole dm minus 3. We can see that we need one for every five of these. So that means the moles of the MnO4 minus would be 0 0.01 divided by 5, right? Which is 0 0.002 moles. If this is how many moles we need for this reaction to do its job, so V equals N over C, which is going to be 0 0.002 divided by the concentration which they gave us which is going to be 0 0.02. If we do that, we get a volume of 0 0.1 decimeters cubed. If we convert that to centimeters cubed, that is 100 centimeters cubed, which is C, nah. What is the concentration of NaOH in mole per decimeter cubed that has a pH of this? So we're thinking pH. pH measured it measures H+. Plus. The entire thing is that it measures H+, plus, but they've given us Kw, and Kw equals H+, plus times OH-, minus, right? So in your head, you're like, huh, what links H+, plus and OH- minus together? Well, this does. And then you should be thinking, what links this to this? And now it all kind of falls together because this is a strong base, which means it will dissociate nearly entirely into Na plus and OH minus, right? So then this concentration must be this concentration, which is also equal to that. So then you would work out OH minus is concentration, which would just be Kw over H plus is concentration. They give you the pH, right? So then this will become... So Kw is 1 times 10 to the minus 14. In order to find the H plus again, you do 10 to the minus the pH, so 10 to the minus 14.3. If you do that, you get 1.995, right? Which is roughly 2. So the answer here is D. And also, you can't have a negative concentration, so I don't even know how, like, come on, don't do that. Which compound is formed when phenyl benzene carboxylate is hydrolyzed under acidic conditions. So that's a hefty name, but if you just do it step by step, so it's benzyl benzene carboxylate, so C double bond O and O something, but it's got phenyl stuck on it, phenyl something something O8, or oxalate. That's what this is. Now you should be able to spot that that is an ester. So if you're going to hydrolyze it under acidic conditions, what you'll end up making is you're going to make an, a carboxylic acid, Again, because it's undoing it, remember? And then you're also going to make an alcohol from this side. HO like that.
So what we end up making is which compound is formed when you do that, so it's whichever one of those fits the bill there. So here, C6H5CH2OH has got an extra methyl, well, alkyl group, sorry, on it, so that's not at. Here, C6H5CHO, that is benzene with an aldehyde on it, so it's not that. C6H5COCH3, that's a ketone, so that's immediately not it. So D is C6H5COH, carboxylic acid, so there you go, it's D. So with titrations, we're messing around with moles, concentrations, and volumes. So they've, it said here that the volume of acid needed from the burette to do this titration was higher. So N equals CV, V equals N over C, right? The moles that you're going to need is going to be the same because it's the same reaction. It's just the concentration must have got, you know, changed. So if they needed a bigger volume of acid, then that must have mean that the concentration of the acid will have dropped. Whichever one of these explains a decrease in the concentration of acid would be that, right? So the conical flask is rinsed with water. Well, that's what the base is in, so that doesn't affect the acid, so that's out. The walls of the conical flask is rinsed with water. Again, that would dilute the base, not the acid, because the acid's in the burette. The pipette was only rinsed with water. Again, that would dilute the base, because we're using that to measure the same amount each time to put in the conical flask that we're using, so that's not the burette, that's out. The burette was rinsed only with water. That's where the acid is in, and if there's water in it, that would dilute the acid, which means you'd have to use a bigger volume to actually get the titration going, so it has to be D. There you go. Thank you very much. I hope that helped. Please like, share, and subscribe. You know the drill.